Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. It's great to be here. When folks ask you, what do you do? How do you answer that question? Oh, my goodness. That's uh, way more complicated than it sounds on the surface. My day job is, I'm, as you said, the co-founder and uh, partner in Renewal Funds, which is a mission venture capital fund. Uh, We dubbed it a mission venture capital because we wanted to make clear that the starting point for us is what's really the purpose uh, who who are the people? What do they care about? What are their goals in life? And does that align with long-term values of resilience and soft landing and a cleaner economy and a more fair and just safer world? And we want to know first about that mission and why the product or service is going to make a difference in the world. So otherwise, we are a fairly typical smaller or boutique venture capital fund looking for companies that are uh, past a million in sales and in which we become an investor of one to five million dollars on a first first time in and we are based in vancouver canada uh, investing in both canada and the u.s now the what do i do extends a little further And I think the best way to say that right now is that my goal is to do everything that I can while I have my capacities to advance the idea of a clean money revolution, which helps move trillions of dollars from damaging and destructive practices towards regenerative, long-term focused thinking. And... Uh, that takes uh, that that the way that I do that shows up in various forms. One is this investment entity. Second is a long time involvement in building an ecosystem of social entrepreneurs across lots of different sectors, intergenerational, and with a peer learning and relationship connectivity approach. And what I mean by all of that is that we've become a bit too segmented and sectored and we're losing touch with the the whole picture of things. And I believe that our society needs lots to do with money and finance and successful positive businesses. It also needs a thriving not-for-profit sector. It needs the helping professions It needs emotional and psychological intelligence to deal with the amount of change that we're facing. And 
it needs a return to an understanding of where we came from and what our responsibility is as the ancestors of tomorrow. Let's take the first part of that. So some some folks have said and say to date that venture capital itself is one of the problems of the current economy. Um, so mission venture capital. So how do you what are you differentiating with mission venture capital? A number of, I guess, subtle and less subtle aspects. But I, I, I the most important one I started out this this conversation with, which is we want to know that the entrepreneurs actually care about things that matter beyond just making money. Making money is important, and we live in a world in which economic activity uh, is is essential to. Uh, to the, the the dealing with seven billion people going on ten billion and who knows how many, dealing with global crisis uh, in climate and species extinction in ocean acidification in food systems, all of the basic systems that we depend on, our human ingenuity has uh, unbridledly through the industrial industrial revolution era. Uh, caused us to push past limits that we otherwise in earlier times may not have been able to do. And so we really now need a generation of change makers who apply themselves in all walks of life. life. But business being one of those as the great uh, driver and power of current times needs to be directed, as I mentioned earlier, towards a multi-generational approach. And it's time now to overhaul our entire economy, whether it's transportation, energy, the built environment, food systems, and pretty much all of the ways that we live in modern times so that we're thinking about carbon, carbon pricing, externalities, uh, whole life cycle with supply chain, justice, fairness, and equality, the taxation system, we need a more whole view of things to become dominant. To bring that back to what is mission venture capital, well, within venture capital, our goal is to be humane, to focus on products and services that we think will advance um, that list of of topics that I mentioned earlier. And we live in an imperfect world. So our job is to select and find where the values that we feel and care about align with an entrepreneurial team and a vision um, of why they're doing what they're doing, what they're going to do with their success. I really like to ask the question of, well, how much money do you want to make and what are you going to do with it? What, what then? Um, and, and so this is just a way really to name that other values besides making money need to be incorporated into the bottom line of business. So we call it mission venture capital to hold ourselves to a standard and to attempt to uh, – find our way to partnership with with the people that most align with this kind of vision. Great. And do you target then um, traditional venture capital rate of returns, or is there a different sort of profile of company you look at? Well, this is the interesting task that we took on. Uh, first of all, we launched during the recession of 07, 08 as a first-time fun to ask for outside money. And we uh, very um, boldly uh, said, we, w- we believe that in our industries, which focus primarily on organic food and personal care products and green technologies of one kind or another, uh, we believe that these are emerging tomorrow industries that have tremendous growth to them but are underlooked uh, at by conventional capital. Also, we're in a boutique 
boutique size phase where a lot of venture capital has gotten so large that they can't write checks as small as we're we're doing in the one to five million dollar range. And so our premise was we will make a market uh, IRR return rate uh, over time with our investments because this is this is, these are investable sectors. So we felt that it was important uh, and still is very important that the reform of the financial sector is one of the toughest of all and that for us to offer products to individuals, families, uh, charitable foundations, and SRI wealth managers that, that actually aligned values with venture – was unique in itself and needed to be proven. And and raising money in a recession and trying to figure out a business that would work, that's the model that we came up with. Could you highlight two or three either past or current portfolio companies that are you know you're particularly proud of that think that kind of match that impact plus financial return goal? Well there's so many to pick from now because we're something like uh, uh, close to twenty companies now. Um, so I'll pick one of my recent favorites first, which is Farmhouse Culture. And Farmhouse Culture is a probiotics business that started around fermentation, sauerkraut, and a very, very old school product that uh, most people today don't even know about, which was what was done in, in Europe in earlier times where Cabbage with salt creates kraut and keeps the cabbage all winter, and it also produces liquid. And that liquid is very probiotics and other nutrient-rich and was given as a morning tonic to kids as uh, that didn't have a, a, lot, a lot else. So kraut juice uh, led to the launch of a product called Gut Shot. <laughs> that, Sounds amazing. That, that farmhouse has has on the shelves in in uh, some of the Whole Foods regions and and expanding now, and so this so the byproduct of making kraut creates uh, kraut juice, and then that gets flavored with different vegetables and and uh, spices and things, and it's very tasty. It's savory, ready to drink uh, beverage, and and then we have recently uh, brought in a not just a new CEO but a new CEO with his, a lot of his team that has gone through two prior organic natural food uh, significant growth stories. And the goal now is to move more broadly into probiotic products and uh, bring uh, new categories to the marketplace. So I'm very excited for a lot of reasons there. One, on the sheer entrepreneurial uh, challenge of, of all that and, and the, the, the large goals, but also the, the very deep uh, health qualities, uh, the, the uh, d deep organic values and creativity uh, involved with the food sector. One of the reasons I love food is because we all use it. And uh, innovation in food is surprising that there's still so much to do, a lot of which is about going back to traditions that – came before the Industrial Revolution. But in any case, farmhouse culture. I was just imagining a, a, someone from J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs saying, you're doing what? <laughs> Gut shot? But I think that's what you're, you're looking at, is these are underserved market categories. That is exactly the point. And uh, I've, I've, uh, I'm in my 60s now. I've been around enough to have the pleasure of being discounted and patted on the head uh, for many, many decades, for several decades, just in even caring about organic food or caring about things like B corporations and the idea that, that business could be a driver for social goods. Those are, those are concepts that those same people uh, might still be skeptical of, though, as you know, they're paying attention now. Maybe it's because they're clients are paying attention. Maybe it's because of the generational shift of power that's underway with 30 to $50 trillion that's going to change hands 
in the U.S. and Canada in the next three decades. That is moving to people that grew up on different values, different access to information. But, but in any case, uh, being uh, looked at with a raised eyebrow by conventional mainstream players becomes one of the great joys of working in the, the be, be the change realms because we get to have the satisfaction of caring deeply about something that we, we feel we know in our bones really matters. And like other entrepreneurs that might be driven by they know it's going to work, this is knowing it matters and it's going to work. And it's okay. And you can make money that way. Was there another one of the other companies that you're excited about? Oh, I will pick a less exotic one for this one and say Cascadia Windows and Door Manufacturing Facility uh, in the greater Vancouver region. It is a fiberglass window and door manufacturer that was started as an offshoot of an engineering firm very involved in the green building revolution that Vancouver is has been quite uh, out front in, pushing hard. You can't get rezoning for uh, construction these days without lead gold, lead platinum, and many, many other features built into your, into your uh, buildings. So fiberglass is vastly more efficient than vinyl or aluminum. And even in a lot of lead buildings, there's a lot of heat leaking because of the window frames and the door frames. So Cascadia started as a specialty manufacturer for, uh, you might say, uh, uh, the Deeper Green Believers. And those, er those early projects that happened where governments were funding to do green in every level, you know, a visitor center at a park or, or things like that. So they started there and driven by the growing awareness and climate issues and environmental and conservation topics. Uh, ultimately, this is, a, this is a climate product because you're mostly still using fossil fuels to heat a building and then you're losing a lot of the heat unnecessarily because your windows and doors are not sealed well enough. So they, this uh, Cascadia is uh, run, having to run three shifts, move to a new plant, growing rapidly. And as regulation around building codes changes, West Coast is where most of it is starting. Um, it looks like the sky's the limit for uh, where a company like this can go that's developed the expertise and the technology to be able to do a better element for the built environment. Here's a question that I've struggled with, and perhaps you uh, and other folks in the space is, how do you measure impact? Because you know there's outputs and outcomes, and uh, a lot of debate about what exactly is impact. So I'm interested in you. Uh, how would you define it, and how do you measure it in your companies? Well, the practical thing that we do is we make use of existing measures and measurements. Uh, because this is its own, this is its this is its own industry. It's a career to make to figure out how to define and measure impact. You can you can have you can have several staff devoted to it full time. So we start with being a, a Gen member, a Gears rated fund, uh, one of the early B Corporation investment funds a 1% for the planet, a living wage employer, a climate offset business. And we use all of the uh, existing intermediary, I shouldn't say all, but we use a wide variety of existing intermediaries. B Corporation is particularly important and valuable to us. And when we started, uh, it was early in, in, in the B ratings, and they were fairly one size fits all, which didn't work very well for a fund. I mean, we were dealing with questions about our roles in the developing world, but we didn't have any 
roles in the developing world. So we were losing points on things like that. And gradually, just like this industry is building, uh, B Corp evolved and the standards evolved. And uh, now there are uh, lots of different segmented ratings for different subsets of industries and things. And But the next part of that is we then turn and use that in our due diligence. So we end up with a very well thought through long list of questions that go into things that would be hard to make up that list by yourself. So we use that as part of our due diligence before investing. Next, we we strongly encourage, we do not force, but we strongly encourage our portfolio companies to become B-rated, which about two-thirds of them have done. And we will provide staff, in addition to what uh, B Corp does, to help them uh, get get through this because now we're we're bought into the system where we're rated and we want our companies to be rated and we want them to do better. So those kinds of incentive, uh, those kinds of incentives that you, know, you could say maybe they're psychological or they're branding or, or whatever, whatever the reason is, they're working. We, we attempt to beyond the use of these uh, outside certifications and, and validators. Uh, uh, we, we have made the list of the impact assets 50, 50 best in the world some several times uh, as a fund and things like that. So we tend to point to those certifi- certifications and certifiers and to our adherence to various other standards, to our company's uh, adherence to that. And then we tell stories. We uh, talk about how Alter Eco, the fair trade organic chocolate, quinoa, and other basic uh, uh, food product companies, uh, what they do uh, with how far they go into the um, uh, farmer co-ops in in Bolivia and Peru and the work that they do there. And uh, we we talk about uh, uh, prana out of Montreal is a fair trade organic uh, snack, nut and seed and and uh, prepared snacks uh, business that's done very, very well. We're in um, a, a company that does uh, animal tracking technologies from rhinoceros and mountain goats to butterflies, sparrows, and minnows. Wow. Uh, and, they, and so they're helping on various environmental and species protection acts and places where uh, uh, change is happening in the environment and what's the effect on species, things like that. So we'll tell stories. Uh, as the other component. And the final comment I'll make about it is uh, having been asked this question for many, many years since I've been claiming, uh, uh, you know, socially responsible or, you know, those those kinds of terms for quite a long time. Uh, I say, well, well, we're entrepreneurs and we need other people to build out these these uh, ratings and, and, and metrics industries because it's kind of a squishy ball. There's there's so many different features that you can you could grade on and there's so many things that are hard there's there's the objective and there's the subjective and my concern about ratings and metrics is to use them in proper dosage or if they become the sole driver you can lose the spirit and the soul and the love from the uh from the whole thing you're trying to do yeah you know another piece that's that's really interesting is uh, for example, I listened to an interview with Chris Saka. For folks who don't know, he's a, a sort of famous angel investor from Silicon Valley, invested in Twitter, and actually invested in Kickstarter. And he had a rule that I'm interested in. You have, if you have similar rules or you know any advice you could give to folks, but his rule was: I only invest in companies that are already on their way to success. I never invest in companies that are going to need a lot of work when I invest in them. And he says that's that's helped him have a lot of winners because he always just is like kind of hitching on to a, ra- a wagon that's already going far. And I'm wondering, it may be easier for Chris Saka to do because he's only looking at financial performance. But for you, I'm wondering if there's certain rules or frameworks, you know, it's probably a whole podcast worth of stuff, but maybe just a few that come to the top of your head that you use when looking at companies to invest in. Well, I mentioned some of these earlier for myself. I mean, we we do uh, probably fairly typical due diligence 
and then I've mentioned some of the plus we do of, of that on values, ethics, um, meaning, and purpose, really, of, of the team and what it's all about. Um, I am really interested to know why somebody wants to make $100 million and then and why they want to make a billion dollars, et cetera, and what for. I want to know what for. Uh, and so you might say there's that component that gets into a more philosophical uh, and, and values kind of screen. But in terms of rules that uh, make it work for us, I mean, there's there's kind of mundane ones like, how far are we going to travel to how many different cities? Um, do we know enough about this sector or industry to feel like we're being responsible with our investors' money? Um, we, we ask for a, a million dollars in sales uh, existing before we go in. Now, that's a conservative and conservatizing move that means – to some degree, these companies are on the road to success, but by no means are companies guaranteed to be successful because of a million dollars in sales. And and so it's uh, we have a formula that goes something roughly like this, which is in a portfolio of ten companies. Uh, oh well, here's 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 one example. Maybe this is a, a kind of a rule. You hear this thing about uh, two fly, eight die or kill early and kill often as, as venture rules. Um, we're having a hard time with that. We want eight of 10 to survive and thrive, whether they are going to be uh, giant successes that we retire on is less important than that we're working on supporting things that matter with people that care that will have some resilience and make a difference. And we'd rather have a portfolio of solid, steady performers that maybe don't get the headlines and aren't that flashy, but those those companies need money. So we're not we're 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 looking for steady steady growth, not uh, hyperbolic growth. Because that's a very, I just say it's a very, very different thing to be doing. And we have investors that back us. I should mention we have over 150 different investors for $98 million and that they are, they are non-big institutions. They're not big institutions. And this gives us a harder job on tracking back office uh, keeping up just with addresses alone and names of entities as people change where they, they hold something. But we also have a broad-based support that buys the premise of this long-term view of what the purpose of money is in the world and why we need to support a broad number of companies to success to, 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 to build towards success that may be less thrilling than a brand, brand new type of technology, uh, d digital uh, platform, but they take care of everyday needs of people. So maybe the rule is we look for existing proof of success, solid, steady performance in a product that's bringing something new that has the opportunity to grow at a rate that exceeds the mid-teens return rate we'd like to gather for our investors and uh, have most of our portfolio still standing. And, and that feels more satisfying for us than we got the huge, uh, the huge sexy win and everything else was irrelevant. Yeah. And you, yeah. And like you said, you have those 150 investors probably put a lot less pressure on you than say CalPERS or the Harvard endowment or something would put on. That you. is the, that is the, uh, kind of secret of it is that nobody's, uh, putting in money that they have to live or die on. And they have, have 
they have accepted and they like our premise for various reasons that can range from personal epiphany to meaning and purpose of life at later age to uh, delivering something that their kids can understand. And uh, and then they, they like the premise that health and uh, cleaning up the environment and protecting the world are are positive things to do. So we find it um, actually wonderful to have this many investors because they bring an unbelievable mix of skills and connections and points of views, all of which uh, we we end up drawing on in one way or another. So let's let's talk about your. There's rumors you have an upcoming book, Clean on Clean Money. So what is what is clean money and what's your book all about? Well, clean money is a an aspiration. Cleaner money is uh, what I've been talking about here. Uh, okay, the premise of clean money revolution is where is your money and what is it doing to whom and what places right this minute? So if you think about your bank accounts, you think about your stock market holdings, you think about the business that you own, how have we gotten to a place in the world where we can go be – base our integrity and our actions, our, our definition of being a good person only on our politeness and our caring for individuals that we can see and touch and feel while we let our money – on our behalf, in our names, go and wreak havoc on other people's lives and children and places that they live. Now, I find this, and I have for a long time, a very confusing ethic. And it makes me question where the education systems, the religious institutions, and broad culture have been around the fact that money is okay to separate from who we are as people and what our basic core values are, but it's okay that we don't even pay attention to what our money is doing on our behalf right this minute. So that's the core premise. I then map uh, with personal stories a lot of the things I've experienced and seen around these uh, entrepreneur stories and investing money and trying to figure out these questions for myself. In other words, uh, the personal journey that got me like this, I know that in my teens and 20s, I read a lot of people's journeys that helped me break out of convention and the norm by just hearing the stories of how other people had, had done things. And so as a 61-year-old, I feel some responsibility to share that. And it also – the point of it, though, is over these last 30, 40 years, I've been fortunate to have ended up in some of the origin points, organizations, networks, and uh, uh, entrepreneurs that have led to the fact that we're having the conversation we are today about the topics that we are today. So I'm also – attempting to map a slice of the movement which has happened you could you could track it one of the simple ways to describe it would be 40 years ago to even talk about organic foods was to almost get you uh laughed out of the dinner conversation it's now a major industry lots of fortunes are being made and it's well below 10 percent of the north american food dollar forget the rest of the world it's probably one percent still i know that personal health, health of workers, health of planet is going to continue growing clean food. I believe that as we bring attention to these questions about money and making it cleaner, so to speak, making it more aligned with our values and what we actually believe in and care about is going to move tens of trillions of dollars and we are going to rebuild the economy in a much more clean, resilient, long-term way to cope with the situations that we have on the planet. And the conclusion to the book is the call to action 
to ancestral responsibility that those of us alive today are the first generation that had the ability to destroy as much as we do. And that therefore, the responsibility that we have is enormous for us to start thinking about where the money is and what it's doing and to align that with what we truly believe in. So I will attempt to convey that and share fun stories. Uh, and we finished the manuscript with my co-writer, Tai Bridge, for the publisher, New Society Publishers, uh, a kind of a regional, uh, a regionally produced book based on what started as a regionally focused, uh, bio-regionally focused kind of uh, a strategy that, that I had. Um, and so that should be out next spring. And uh, Fantastic. I'm excited about it. Uh, so next spring, and the name of the book again? Clean Money Revolution. Clean Money Revolution. It's so within that, is it... Is it sort of tips and best practice ideas for individuals to align our personal wealth, or is it more for businesses, or what's sort of the focus? I would say that the central focus is about our personal wealth, and I will do my best to cover what is a very wide spectrum, but the real focus will be on those who have enough and more than enough, and therefore are are making choices that that really are uh, not about survival. Um, I I can't address those issues as effectively, but I can say that a large majority of certainly uh, the d developed world are making choices about where to bank. And we should understand what happens to that money when we put it in a bank or a credit union, an international bank or a local bank, that we generally have some kind of retirement fund or some, some bit of money that we're saving. What's that saved in? Are we comfortable enough? Now, I also know that the financial system has not yet created options for a lot of us. But even to ask the question is to be a change agent. Ask the question to your wealth advisor, to your mutual fund seller, to your to your retirement fund. So the focus really, the ultimate focus are on those uh, people that are going to control the, the 30 to 50 trillion dollars that's that's going to move in the next three decades through death that uh, a new generation and a next generation inspired hopefully by the existing generation in power that controls most of the financial resources are accepting responsibility and beginning to make moves so that younger people can do it smarter, better, faster, uh, and that uh, 30 years from now you won't need to have this kind of conversation. It will be a much different one. And so with, are you optimistic or pessimistic? For... Yes, 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 I am. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, the, the way I like to answer that is in my head, I'm pessimistic. It, it, the facts don't look good to me and, and the trends. In my heart, uh, I can't possibly know. I, it's too big. And I have to live with hope and I have to do everything that I can do for that which I believe in, and I have to encourage as many others to do the same. And I'm a believer in the powerful force underneath it all of love. And I consider love the certainly the access to, if not the divine. And that love of the future, love of, of, of people, love of life, love of fairness and justice and, and these kinds of things, um, is is underneath it all and if properly invited opened up to activated and increasingly used as a guide that it is possible 
we have all the tools we have we have all the willpower uh we really though have to step up and we we've got to keep doing better than uh the era which we've gone through in which it was easy to stick our heads in the sand about a lot of bigger issues so uh my call to action is all in all in and, and double now down. <laughs> double down double down and you can have fun i have a lot of fun this is this is not a misery march this is a, a, a joy and uh joy hope and love well fantastic and you know maybe just one or two last questions for folks just so they can get any you know, one one question I had is, um, who else are you watching? Like, who's inspiring you and really leading this ideal that you just described? Some of the people that I'm very excited about, first of all, are the highly intelligent that are giving up uh, careers that could be financially driven to go out and lead not-for-profit organizations and build movements and try to bring forward the kinds of issues that I've, I've referred to lightly, the climate activists, the Reverend Lennox, Reverend Lennox Yearwood and the Hip Hop Caucus that's bringing hip hop musicians to the climate justice movement and helping uh, branch into new constituencies. And and the uh, the the meeting of uh, indigenous people and environmental activists in Canada that are working on on reforming fossil fuels and and uh, to to make them a long term uh, a long term precious resource rather than to just burn it all as fast as we can. <laughs> and so there there are there are those kinds of movements that I'm very inspired by. And then an, another area though that I'm particularly excited by are the ones who are coming out of those social change movements and coming to or, or pol- politics. Uh, a lot of people from the Howard Dean and the uh, Obama era uh, of of modern digital organizing and and more grassroots organizing in that way, so a number of them are going into businesses, and they've gone into businesses around let's say distributed solar uh, and solar rooftops, or uh, uh, res- uh, renewable energy credits and uh, 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 electricity. Um, uh, delivery to, to uh, individual consumers and, and building firms that are based around cleaner energy and uh, people like uh, Credo using telephone services and, and selling memberships there and then taking uh, big chunks of that money and putting it back into change activities. And so the, the meeting of the marketplace and activism is where I guess I've dedicated my career and I'm really excited now to see bright younger characters having big, big successes in building consumer-based power while making money and proving that all of that can work together towards moving issues in society. I love that. And is there a book that you often give as a gift to somebody to say, here's, here's something you should check out. Here's what I think is a great example of, of this. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I would, You're writing I, I think, it, right? <laughs> well, no, it's not. It's not just that. But I would just say there's. It's it's more like this. Seek and ye shall find. There is a garden cornucopia of great things underway. Mainstream media is not available to tell us about it. Probably for the most part, uh, we're besieged with random information and distraction and disaggregation and 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 uh, that kind of thing. And so I believe that each person, as they feel a calling from wherever that comes, to make a contribution in a bigger way and step past the the kind of uh, conventionality of my sole purpose in life is to accumulate a bunch of money and then figure out what I'm going to do with my life, um, that there's no one-size-fits-all. There's so many different pathways, and it depends. And that's and that's the beauty of uh, of life, and it's the beauty of of these times in which diversity and complexity and the richness of multiple ecosystems and deep and broad ecosystems is 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 truly flourishing. Uh, maybe outside the uh, mainstream eye, but there is cultural change underway that is happening, and therefore the book or 
uh, the idea, the teacher, those kinds of things. I'm uh, more interested in the eclectic pathway and the uh, d d diverse mix of influences. Um, I'm biased to it because that's how I kind of figured out my life was to just get exposed to a lot of different things. But there's something innate in nature and in natural systems that does work that way, where complexly, complexity and diversity creates strength. And I think that as society, the face of society is changing in uh, U.S. and Canada in demographically and in uh, ideas and in, in all kinds of ways that uh, my encouragement is, is, is keep asking the questions to yourself. Work on your inner skills the, the mechanical ones, the how to run a business, all that stuff, that's all very learnable. What we're overlooking is to find out who we are as people, what truly motivates us, how we handle conflict, how we are in relationships, how we handle our deathbed. And so the book I would send you to is to think about your deathbed and what you want to feel and what you want to have accomplished and what you want to look back on. And if you start considering the fact that that is the great equalizer and you therefore have an opportunity, you might get lucky and have 50 or 80 years. But by the time you're going to have these conversations, let's say 50 years, you may have 50 years to dedicate yourself to finding a pathway and an inspiration to be a unique contributor to the world. And you may have, if you do that, you have found, I think, the great book of life, which is about meaning and purpose and uh, whatever it takes to figure out your meaning and purpose. That's where I would, if I could hand, if I could hand that out, that would be the, uh, That'd be the substance. Wow. I think you're the only venture capitalist who uh, would talk so amazingly about figuring out your purpose on your deathbed. So um, where can folks find out more about uh, your work, uh, renewal funds, maybe a website and email? or So renewalfunds.com and the uh, joelsolomon.com. Dot net website is coming soon that is I'm finally doing because of becoming an author and uh, uh, I'll start I'll start uh, coordinating there and I'll just say I'm on all the social media or I'm on a lot of the social media as Joel Solomon thanks everyone for listening um, renewalfunds.com joelsolomon.net is coming soon and uh, the clean money revolution next economy now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.